Hey, Pamela. Can you hear me? Hey, Fraser. How's it going? Good. I can hear you. You can I hear can me. I can hear you. Can you is, hear me? I can hear you. Is all this technology working? You were mentioning that you were having a bit of technology fail this week. As... Oh my gosh! So so last week, um, yeah. At one point, my husband comes into my office and he's doing a literal happy dance that his company was getting him a new work computer. And while he was doing this, I go to take down my screensaver and type in my password, and my hard drive fails. At that very moment, my hard drive fails. And um, yeah. I I spent several days last week desperately, desperately trying to um, resurrect the poor bastard, but when your hard drive is eating itself and making chewing noises, the best you can do is get the photos that you uploaded onto your computer the previous day and hadn't backed up yet um, rescued. So I did that. No photos. Well, some photos were lost, but no important ones. And... I'm now working off of my MacBook Air, which hates my guts right now. It 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 was not meant for what I've tried to do with it. And right. the iMac is in the hallway. Fixed. I just picked it up from the Apple Store, and as soon as we're done, as soon as we're done, I'm installing that iMac back on my desk. We could wait until if you then. Want. I yeah. I'm angry, broken human. <laughs> no, no, we all know the computers are off when we it's, hate them. Yeah, I I am a you don't have to explain this to us. We know. We know how terrible computers are. Yeah. Anyway, but this is not a complaint about computers. <laughs> what you're watching is a live episode of Astronomy Cast, where Dr. Pamela Gay and I will uh, spend about uh, 28 minutes talking about the question of the week, which in this case is uh, 3D printed, 3D printing in space. Um, and uh, man, I'm so excited. For space. This. In space, Earth. also in space. For space and in space. i got some great stories about this, too. Yes, um, both. Uh, and then we will stick around and we'll answer your questions about space and astronomy. I have enabled the Q&A app, and it broke when I enabled it. But fortunately, I was able to then re-enable it before we actually started the broadcast. So I am now adding this to my checklist, which is... See, every question you ask is... Is what? Every question they ask is one question that prevents me from... Every question they ask is a question that prevents me from setting up my iMac. Oh, no, no. It's, it's, it's just more inspiration. Um, so, uh, yeah, so anyway, so I'm going to have to add this to the checklist, which is that when <laughs> I turn on the Q&A app, did it actually work? You know? Like, imagine, like, you turn on a light switch, and then you have to have some way of, like, independently verifying if that light switch actually worked. Anyway, that's fine. I'm happy. I'm rolling with punches. I'm ready to go. I'm just going to add it to my checklist. Um, okay, so uh, let's get cracking. Are you ready? Okay. Okay. Yeah. I'm finding the record button. Um, I am pressing record. It's yeah. actually recording. It's all very exciting. In mono? It's using the correct microphone in mono. Awesome. All right, well, then let's just assume it, it's, it's going. Are you, I can't hear you. Why can't you hear okay. me? Can you hear me now? Okay, so I looked over the screen. Green, yes, but there's like a three-second lag between your gorgeous high-fidelity photo and and when your lips move from right. the audio I'm hearing. Right, and I'm going to guess that's because GarageBand is gobbling up all the resources on your computer once you click record. I'm not using GarageBand. I'm using Audacity. Wow, well then I can't scold you. And actually, it's your photo... No, it's it's actually your video that's in sync and looks gorgeous mm -hmm. and your audio that's several seconds behind. I don't know what to tell you. You're just gonna have to just gonna have to imagine you heard my answers in the future. Answer the question that you think I'm gonna ask, not the question that I actually do. 
I I'm I can't lip read you or I would, but Don't. it's really going to be profound. Okay, yeah. not looking at the out of sync photo. Putting Last a nasty week. window on top of the out of sync video. Right. I'll be interested to know if other people are experiencing this too. So if you're using the Q&A app, let me know. Do you see me out of sync as well or is it just Pamela? Um, uh, okay, great. And then why don't we record and I will ask my question and then I will just wait patiently for your answer and I will try not to interrupt you. We're sorry, Preston. We're sorry, uh, Preston. No way. This makes his job easier. Um, okay. This is where you, I wait three seconds for your laugh. Yeah, okay, we get, we get, this is going to be this is going to be something. All right, let's just get rolling. Here we go. Astronomy Cast, episode 355, 3D printing exploration. Welcome to Astronomy Cast, our weekly facts-based journey through the cosmos, where we help you understand not only what we know, but how we know what we know. My name is Fraser Kane. I'm the publisher of Universe Today, and with me is Dr. Pamela Gay, a professor at Southern Illinois University, Edwardsville, and the director of CosmoQuest. Hey, Pamela, how are you doing? I'm doing well. How are you doing, Fraser? I am doing great. Uh, we've worked through most of the technical issues that we were experiencing last week, but apparently we have new technical issues. But f hopefully the folks on the, uh, the audio recording won't even notice because, once again, Preston will come to our aid and edit everything beautifully together. Yeah, for, for those of you who aren't laughing at us as we try and do this live, we have about three seconds of lag between uh, when something is said and when it is heard by the other person. So uh, it's, it's going to be like one of those awkward satellite broadcasts with the foreign correspondent that you sometimes see on the nightly news. Yeah, come on. These, these messages have to go all the way to space and back. So... All right, well, let's get cracking. Uh, we'll, do, we'll get on with the show then. So getting stuff into space is complicated and expensive. And what do you do when your fancy space gadget breaks? You print out a new one, of course, with your fancy space 3D printer. So it turns out space exploration is one of the best uses for this technology. And Pamela, before we get into sort of your experience with 3D printing and space, I just wanted to regale you with one of my uh, recent anecdotes, which was I was fortunate enough to be invited to SpaceX, uh, which is in Los Angeles. And um, we were there taking a look at the, uh, the technology they have. And one of the things that they have is the ability to 3D print titanium. And so one of the engineers gave me a block of this titanium, and I took a look at it. And he said, "Go ahead and and look through, look at look at a light." And so you take this, this block of titanium and you peer through it, and I could see micron-sized holes, like a like it was half transparent. And that's the resolution of the 3D printing. And so now a lot of the fancy 3D parts that are made over at SpaceX are done using 3D printed. 3D printers to print titanium in three dimensions. So that's my cool anecdote. So 3D printers in space, for space. They're awesome. See, I, I have nothing that cool that I can share. The best I can say is every first experience I've ever seen anyone have with a 3D printer has involved making something that looks like it melted horrifically in the sun. Um, but the thing is, once you actually get them working, you can do all sorts of amazing things and there's zero waste. This is the real awesome promise of 3D printing. Right now with manufacturing, most of what we do is subtractive. You take a chunk of some substance and you cut away the parts you don't need and you end up with a whole bunch of leftover stuff. Um, in woodworking, you end up with sawdust that then goes on to be animal bedding. In woodworking, that's kind of okay, but when you start to get to metalworking, now you have all of this stuff that you can now expend more energy melting again, and sometimes you just end up with a whole lot of slag and piles outside, creating super fun sites. But with 3D printing, you take your alloy, you put it into the machine, it melts what it needs, and it's an additive process where it just layers the stuff a bit at a time on top, 
And, and in addition to not having waste, because it's an additive process, you can also build multi-layered things in, in a much cheaper way. Um, this has become especially important with ultrasound machines where the sensors that are used on ultrasound machines to either peer into a knee that has a torn ligament or well look into the side of a spacecraft to see if there's damage in the fuselage. Those types of machines um, you need an additive process or a whole bunch of very carefully put together pieces to build it and so we can bring down costs by using this new additive process. All right, so people who have never experienced, never used, never seen a 3D printer, you know, what kind of a machine are we, are we looking at here? The, the best way to explain it is if you can imagine a um, cake decorating thing that you can move around on a printer and as it moves around it extrudes a extrudes a thin layer of material how small that thin layer of material is depends on the machine depends on the substance it's being used we currently have 3d printers that work on everything from plastics up through well titanium so with any of these different materials that you can melt under high heat or melt using different chemical reactions. There's a few that work that way where you have a powdery substance that you mix with something that turns it into a liquid that then dries hard. With all of these different machines, you're ex extruding the stuff out, basically your cake topper, and moving it around to layer, um, layer upon layer upon layer of the stuff upwards. Um, if you've ever built with Lego blocks, it's kind of a similar process if you build things a layer at a time, except this time instead of having to put down Lego blocks, you're putting down molecules and that's kind of cool. And so what is the, what's the typical resolution of these machines? How small of things can you build with them? Again, it totally depends on what you're building with. Um, when when it comes to plastics, you quite often with the lower cost machines, you have a much lower resolution. So here you're looking at half a millimeter in some cases, sometimes tenth of a millimeter resolution. But then as you start to get to more costly machines and you start getting to work with metals instead, these faster drying and um, less blobby substances with these higher cost machines you start to get down to the tenth hundredth of a millimeter resolution instead. Now do you have a 3D printer? I do not personally have a 3D printer. We have a 3D printer at the STEM Center where I work. The, it's a science, technology, engineering, and mathematics interdisciplinary research center. So we have a little bit of everything. And part of that little bit of everything is a 3D printer that has been used to make everything from random bits and pieces we need for science demos to printing out a model of the asteroid Vesta. And, and what's really neat is is NASA's recognizing how powerful 3D printing can be for education where they're starting to release models of the different asteroids, of the comets, of the planets and this allows people who can't see to actually get their hands on an asteroid and start to understand well they knew what a potato felt like but now they know actually that an asteroid isn't that different. Um, 3D printing is completely changing the, the way we can teach astronomy to the visually impaired. It's changing how we're able to do demos and it's bringing down the cost of spacecraft construction itself. Uh, there are a number of different CANSAT programs that are looking to 3D print the housings, the all of the lightweight bits that hold all of their instrumentation together are now starting to get 3D printed. We're not doing that though. Right, and this was, I guess, the question that I was going to be asking you was, was what 
parts of spacecraft, what kinds of... I mean, I mentioned my, my story about seeing the, the 3D printed titanium at SpaceX. As this technology gets better and better and better, you can imagine all of the kinds of spacecraft parts that they're going to be, be 3D printing. So what is sort of the, the current and sort of future-ish uh, uses of 3D printing in, in space exploration? Well, the, the European Southern, uh, not Southern, the European Space Agency has what they call the AMAZE project. Uh, this is one of those long acronyms that seems kind of forced. It's the Additive Manufacturing Aiming Towards Zero Waste and Efficient Production of High-Tech Metal Products. Uh, yeah, so, so they have that long acronym that's just called the AMAZE project. And they're actually working to 3D print an entire spacecraft. Um, so they, they've been working on this for a couple of years now. They haven't launched anything, but they are hoping in the next year to start going into some space testing of what they're working on. Right. And so this is, I mean, this is just the precursor to the inevitable future where you know, we look at what's going to happen with, say, the planetary resources and these space mining colonies and companies like that that are going to be looking to gather minerals in space and just set them up into facilities orbiting the planet. And then you can imagine in the future there are 3D printed, um, you know, 3D printers in space that are then using the latest plans and they're 3D printing spacecraft that will then help explore the solar system. And so at no point did you need to bring this stuff from the planet. You're just, you're building it up there in space and for whatever mission. It's, it's an astonishing idea. And, and what's really cool about where we're going with this is it's not just building things, but it's being able to also repair things and aim towards self-sufficiency. One of the arguments for having human beings in space has always been we have hands. We have the ability to go out and pick up a rock and decide it's cool and then start digging around and completely change our goal for the day based on finding something that's cool. Well, with 3D printers, we have the ability to augment everything we do with spur of the moment, oh, I need this tool. So instead of taking everything under the sun with us to Mars, we instead take a 3D printer with us to Mars, and now we're able to create everything from our favorite toys back home to uh, a new version of the Pathfinder rover to things that we can't even imagine yet but we may be inspired to create along the way. Um, it, it also starts to raise a lot of um, fascinating issues about copyright, um, and there, there's actually a really awesome short story by Cory Doctorow called Print Crime. And, and I sometimes wonder about what's going to happen when people realize that they can scan in their Tupperware and then print all new Tupperware without having to pay the exorbitant fee. Um, currently though 3D printing isn't quite as cheap as going to Target, um, but that is the future that we're aiming toward. And and so you can, uh, yeah exactly, you can imagine this future where, where for example engineers on Earth figure out a uh, a better way to have some kind of structural part or you know they're designing they they're they're building the blueprints for extending the Mars colony They've, they they know all of the parts that they need to build they know all the bricks they need to create and then they just transfer all of the information along to the colonists and then the colonists start the parts and then assembling them uh, in and to to build out to build out the structure and so they don't need smelters and factories and all this kind of stuff. They just need some way that they can turn uh, the iron-rich Martian brick, Martian rocks into structural elements and let the machine handle a lot of the more complicated elements. So so again, as I mentioned, this this whole idea is, is super exciting. So um, I know that, uh, and I don't know if it's happened already, but there was going to be a 3D printer that was going to be sent to the International Space Station. And I think it 
it went on one of the recent launches, right? It went up in September. And what is what are the NASA folks going to be using this for? Well, right now they're they're looking to test well does a 3D printer actually work well in space? This is actually one of those stupid problems that zero-g just makes things way harder. Um, ballpoint pens were a problem that we had to overcome where uh, the ink doesn't gravitationally go down towards the roller part of that roller pen and with the 3D printers uh, you now have to keep everything under pressure and you can't rely on gravity to make sure that that layer of material you're adhering actually goes down and adheres to the base. And, and so there's been a specially created 3D printer. It was launched in September. Uh, they're planning to start doing lots and lots of testing in 2015. Right now I'm sure they're going through the whole, oh dear, what I just created looks like the machine had an accident of a terrible kind. Um, all 3D printers, I think, go through that phase. Um, but so far, I haven't been able to find any pictures of anything they've printed. But it is launched, and all the news articles are still saying they're aiming for 2015 space testing of the things they built. At the same time, though, you can imagine the microgravity of being on board the International Space Station might give them an advantage as well, because here on Earth, as they do the 3D printing, as you said, it's this additive process where you've got gravity is holding down the shape that you're trying to build, and then you're you're adding it up layer by layer by layer. But you could imagine if you're in space, and if and if you really wrap your head around what this could be, you could imagine almost like the object floating inside the the 3D printer itself, and it could be adding on on multiple multiple dimensions at the same time, or or rotating the object and adding material. As, as necessary. So if we lived in microgravity, we might be able to spend more time and really get a sense of it. And I think that is the precursor. That's the, you know, getting, understanding how this 3D printing works in the microgravity of Earth orbit is really the key to making this technology work for us in, in the long term. And and unfortunately, this is one of those problems where the imagination versus reality uh, are harshly different. Um, one of the problems that you have with things like the International Space Station is the sucker vibrates, the sucker moves, it jiggles as people move around as they bounce off the walls. And all of that instability means that if you have your inertial object happily floating in the center of, of the printer, um, when the printer bumps, it's not going to bump. You you have to anchor everything just as solidly as you do on Earth. Um, so so you both have more interesting options in terms of once you get something rotating, it stays rotating more readily. Um, but you still have the issues of of inertia, and now you have it on an unstable platform. So, so we have to figure out all of that vibrational damping as well as how to exclude stuff without gravity helping you. So then I guess fast forward us to you know, the distant future where we are starting to become more of a space-faring race. You know, what, what role do you see these 3D printers playing in our, in our exploration of the solar system and our ability to live on, on other worlds? Well, one of the great things about 3D printers is while it's not going to be immediately easy to just go to Mars and start mining iron ore in a useful way and finding all of the materials necessary to make the correct alloys to feed into a 3D printer, what is relatively easy is figuring out how to package the materials that goes into the 3D printer in such a way that um, you don't end up with a lot of wasted space in your spacecraft. So if I want to um, build a whole bunch of stuff, I don't have any empty space in what I lift off into space. I simply send up the fuel that I need, uh, not the fuel, the, the 
stuff that I need to feed the 3D printer, whether it be a plastic or an alloy or a straight metal. Um, and then that gets turned into a much larger, much uh, less dense spacecraft that then goes off and explores. Um, over time, it's going to reach the point where we're able to 3D print multiple substances quite readily and so we can layer by layer build up the mirrors of our telescope, the light shield of our telescope, all of the wiring in one long complicated time-consuming print job but that's still something that is just as time-consuming to do here on Earth and now was a whole lot easier to launch into outer space. Um, it, it's also going to change things like instead of uh, ordering something off of Amazon Prime, you're going to be able to be sitting on Mars ordering the plans for something. And commerce will instead be based off of, well, who's come up with the best set of plans to build this item or that item effectively. And um, I can imagine a day where instead of having a Google image search, there's going to be a Google Sculpty search. Um, <laughs> we're getting there. We're just getting there slowly. Uh, it, it's, I think that's a really interesting point that you said, which is that the, the structural strength of a spacecraft needs to be able to withstand the launch of that spacecraft off of the Earth. And so and so the G-forces, and, and in many cases with some of those big spacecraft, the G-forces can be pretty ferocious. They can be five, seven Gs that they have to withstand. And yet, if, if all you needed was a spacecraft that could handle the very gentle nudges from an ion drive or this you know the slight rotations as it's shifting to a new position that's a completely different engineering requirement and so as you said you could build them a lot more light in that they never they've never experienced earth gravity and so they never had to worry about that the other thing that i think is pretty interesting and this is like like literally this is straight from the news is that um they're testing out a new uh, delivery system uh, where people are going to be able to throw these little cargo pods out of the International Space Station. These things will fly back to Earth and they'll re-enter the atmosphere and land with pinpoint accuracy to any place on Earth. And so again, you can imagine, you know, uh, a space-based printer prints off like you know either if you need to get some some materials from space back to Earth, they could they could create these return vehicles fill them with the whatever stuff has been created in space uh, and then return them back to Earth. And it's entirely possible, again, more experimentation is needed. There could be things which, you know, crystals that can be grown, various kinds of, of you know, scientific experiments that can only be done in space with these kinds of, of 3D printers. It's entirely possible that we really do need that zero gravity to make some kinds of things. So, so again, all super fascinating stuff. And, and back in the early days of, of thinking about building the International Space Station and back with the space shuttle, everyone was interested in what happens with materials development in space, what happens with the creation of drugs and, and crystals, as you point out, where you're in this environment where you don't have to worry about things coming out of solution, where you don't have to worry about defects in your crystals because they're adhered to the wall of the solution they're growing within. And we're now looking at a permanent orbiting humanity at least on the International Space Station or at least until 2020 if the Russians kick us off. Um, but with 3D printing it starts to become much more imaginable to see those materials engineers going into space and being able to get the costs low enough that commercial industries can finally strictly from the chemical engineering, materials engineering fake jewelry engineering as as we're creating better sapphires or whatever in space. Um, it it's all comes together as a combination of the chemistry and the construction all being on one platform. That is awesome stuff. All right, well, thanks a lot, Pamela. It's, it's been my pleasure. 
All right. Ah, stop stopping this recording of Doom. Oh, apologies oh. to everybody. Can we try something here? Can you try reloading your 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 Hangout? Like just hit re just hit reload. You know, Control R or Command R while you're on the Hangout, and see if it'll pop you back in. Because that was the worst. Testing, testing. Can you hear me? Are we synchronized? Currently. Let's see if we stay synchronized. We're not synchronized. Nope, we're not synchronized. No, nope. huge delay. Okay, I'm going to try refreshing. Let's see what happens. Testing, testing. Are we synchronized? No, not Clearly at all. Clearly not. Okay. All right. Well, then we are just going to keep struggling through the technology. So let's see if we can handle a couple of questions here. Um, okay. Um, I'm on two okay. screens, guys. That's why I keep looking over here. All right, here we go. Uh, Noel Rippenthal asks, uh, is it possible to 3D print with a material that can be recycled to be 3D printed with it again? Yes, that's called plastic. Plastic yeah. is awesome that way. Some plastic. But that's the, that's the dream, right? That you that you'll take your thing, your instead of throwing it in the garbage, you throw it into the three D printer bucket, and it will get get ready to be used to three D print another thing. There will be no garbage. Pamela, no, that's gone. true. That is the excitement of the future. There there will still probably be food race, food waste. Well, on that Always point... that zucchini that goes bad in the bottom <laughs> drawer. Right. I think I've got one right now. Um, Nancy Graziano says, uh, do you think that we'll be able to 3D print <laughs> certain foods if we have the basic building blocks available? Could that be the premise of the food replicators in the Star Trek universe? They're, they're already 3D printing candy. Um, that that was a gimmick at the Consumer Electronics Show last year in Vegas is some of the vendors were 3D printing various candy. You can 3D print with chocolate. Um, now, admittedly, I'm not sure I'd want a 3D printed meat product. Um, but well, there was the burger. Which is an almond paste I can see being easily 3D printed. Did you hear about that? That there was like that uh, synthetic meat burger that was made. Uh, it was in, I think it was in London. I think um, Google uh, Sergey Brin underwrote the creation of it. I think it cost like two hundred thousand dollars. But the thing was made very carefully, layering stem cell beef uh, structures, and they were able to make a burger. So you can imagine, you know, if somehow a three D printer can generate stem cell printed meat. Then I, it's possible. I, 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 I am a fan of the idea of figuring out how to synthetically grow meat in nutrient base. 3D printing somehow just seems weird, and in either case you're going to get like the most tender meat ever because the muscles will never have been used. It's just, it's, it's the equivalent of like, yeah, it, it will have never moved. So it will be extraordinarily tender and have a very weird texture. But 3D printing it just somehow seems like something you do with pâté, and I don't like pâté, so it's a texture thing. Right. Um, uh, Vance McCauley asks, what kinds of materials cannot be used as printer material? Wood. 
Um, I'm sure there's others. I don't think that we're 3D printing with glass yet. Um, you, you essentially need something that you can melt in a controllable way at a low enough temperature that you're not melting the nozzle of your 3D printer. And that's, I think, where glass starts to get difficult currently. Um, right, currently we're using plastic, ceramics, metals. And you can imagine with wood, I mean, you can't get, like, you can't build a... I don't know, like a block of wood, but you could mix your wood with some kind of um, some kind of glue, some kind of plastic polymer that then, you know, you get some kind of hybrid approach. You want to make fiberboard? Yeah, exactly. Fiberboard, three D printed fiberboard. Um, uh, instead of like IKEA, will will revolutionize this, I'm sure. Um, uh, James Oliver asks, a 3D printing will be very handy for producing IKEA an IKEA doesn't thing. use fiberboard. They use real wood. Oh, okay. I think I've got some IKEA fiberboard somewhere. Um, 3D printing will be very handy for producing an army of self-replicating space robots to take okay. over the galaxy. Yeah, this is exactly right. What James is saying is 100% correct, that this is how we will colonize the entire galaxy. We will, we will land... A 3D printer on another star system, it will scoop up all the available materials and make a copy of itself and send more to other worlds. And in fact, it would take between 1 and 10 million years to fully colonize the entire galaxy. And, and what's really interesting about that is, is Enrico Fermi essentially predicted 3D printing when he talked about self-replicating space probes and where are they. So this is the type of technology that everyone kind of knew had to come along. Gene Roddenberry had it. Um, and now we're, we, we're getting to it. It's, it's starting to work. Uh, Thomas Traniker asks, has anyone printed electronic components or complete circuits? I don't know. I, I simply don't know. The coolest 3D printed thing I know is a fully functional um, replacement limbs for children. And that is particularly cool because in a lot of places um, people just couldn't afford to get the artificial leg, the artificial arm for the quickly growing child. And so children were being held back. They, they were sometimes trying to make limbs last longer than they actually fit correctly. And now that's not an issue. Now you grow, you get a new one. It's not, it's not the same tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of dollar issue it was. And they're actually figuring out how to build the good robotic. Um, they're not the tactile ones yet, but I think only the Army has the tactile ones right now. So it turns out the answer is yes. Um, and in fact, there's a Kickstarter for a thing called the EX-1, it's now called the Argentum, and it is a 3D printer circuit. It makes printing circuits as quick and easy as printing a photo, allowing you to print on the material of your choice. So it lets you 3D print circuit boards. So, so I, I'm just going to assume that the default answer is, is always yes. It's just a matter of whether or not anyone's actually created the prototype to do it yes, yet. Because that's it's crazy. I mean, now now to make really fancy right. chips, you need like a really sophisticated modern chip fabrication plant with lithography, and you're looking at things that are the size of football fields and clean rooms and so on and so forth. But quick and dirty, it sounds like you know we're getting there. Well, quick and dirty, you can do with a circuit marker marker on the correct type of paper. We do that in lab class. Um, let's see. So Rashan Bukhari says, could we 3D print fake money to fund NASA? I believe that's called inflation. Yes. It just doesn't work that way. I wish it did. 
Yeah, and Roshan also asks, could we make bigger telescopes with 3D printing? I think this is what you're driving at. And how? Just We just have to learn how to do it. Yeah, the, this is one... Right, so there, there, there are teams working on it. Lockheed is one of them. Um, where where they're looking at the 3D additive printing of metals to create mirrors, um, and the question is how far are we from being able to get that surface that doesn't require the extreme polishing? Um, that's going to be the next big breakthrough: is getting resolutions good enough to put people who do polishing out of business. Yeah. Get out of business. Um, so Benoit Graham says, uh, can we really colonize the galaxy? Are we prisoner forever in our solar system? Can the 3D printer really make a difference? And, and I mean, yeah, yeah, yes. Yes, we can colonize the galaxy. There's no reason in the laws of physics why we can't. Are we prisoner forever in our solar system? Well, we, me, Pamela, probably Not you. Us. Yeah, we are. Um, but the future generations of humans, or perhaps the our ro future robot overlords, will be able to. Um, but can the 3D printer really make the difference? That's, I mean, the 3D printer is the key. The 3D printer is the is the requirement for the self-replicating robot that you need to be able to colonize the galaxy. For it, you send a spacecraft, it lands in another solar system, it builds a copy of itself, it goes somewhere else. I mean, that's how life works. That's, this is, so yeah, the, I mean, the 3D printer is going to be the technology that's going to make this whole thing possible. And if we won't call it a 3D printer, we will just call it manufacturing. Like in the future, this is just how everything will get made. A printer. Yeah. So... So yeah, we there is no reason why we can't colonize the entire galaxy, which makes the Fermi paradox that more complicated. As we, you know, again, as we um, build the this technology and see it, all the stuff is feasible. You're just like, where are all the aliens? Where are their monoliths? Um. Uh, Bob Harkins notes that the 3D printer on the International Space Station is waiting in queue to go into isolation area for experiments. So that's the update. Which is cool. Okay, cool. Um, I think those are all the questions that I saw. Um... Yeah, so Nancy Graziano notes, uh, 3D printing is going to change manufacturing... Torturing our poor innocent. What's that? I was saying maybe we can stop torturing our poor audience, although let's hear what Nancy had to say first. Sure. Uh, so she said that 3D printing is going to change manufacturing the way the CCD changed consumer photography. Don't like what you printed? Recycle it. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think there's a ton, ton, a metric ton of stuff even that needs to be figured out, even for me, who is happy to speculate wildly at all times. Um, but there will, yeah, there will be this future where we will be able to recycle more and more of the stuff that we make that it will all just turn into an energy problem. You know, you want to build something, you just got to have enough energy and enough raw materials to make the thing go. You don't have the, enough raw materials, throw some of your plastic in, throw some metal, throw your silverware in there, boom. You can make whatever you want. The, the only thing about the recycling that, that gets to me is, is the problem of mixing colors. It, it's sort of like the problem that you had as a kid with Play-Doh is if you built something out of a whole bunch of different colors of Play-Doh you had to completely undo it or give up and have like this pukey greenish bleh color of Play-Doh. So currently when we 3D print with plastics, you have your red plastic, your green plastic, you have all these different colored materials that you extrude. And, and so with 
recycling, you can't get back to white. So it may be a future universe that's designed for the goth among us and everything's in black. And I'm kind of good with that. I look good in black and I decorate with black. Um, but yeah, that, that's the one thing I want to see the solution for is how do you melt all of your plastics and get back to white? It's a stupid problem. No, no, no. I think that's ingenious. You you have really kind of captured one of the problems of future humanity that that everything in the world will be this kind of puke green, I think, or like this this brown uh, you know, <laughs> this sort of this this color of like like whatever is the color of all like like you remember I don't know if you remember they did this research where they're like if you took all the colors of the entire universe and you blended them together, you got this uh, this I forget what the color was. It was like a tan color, um, sort of a yellowish tan color. And so the question that is, you take all. Initially of... thought it was pea soup green, and then it was beige. Be beige. The universe is beige. And so if you take all of the uh, molecules on Earth and you average out their color, their whatever is their spectrum, you'll end up with this color, and that is the color that eventually everything on Earth is going to be pea soup green as it were and that's because we'll be just throwing these things into 3D printers all the time man that is that is a that is an article that we should write that's awesome such a good thought all right well why don't we wrap things up because uh, as you said this is uh, probably making people want to tear their ears out um, but uh, so um, but before we do I want to promote something uh, which is there's a great community on Google Plus which which uh, it's called the WSH Crew, and this is the Weekly Space Hangout Crew, and these are the folks who gather around to talk about the the Weekly Space Hangout every week. But actually, there's a ton of overlap between the the crew and watching the Weekly Space Hangouts and also watching Astronomy Cast and the other stuff that we do. So I just want to give them a big plug. If you go to uh, Google Plus and you do a search for WSH Crew. Uh, a lot of the names uh, that of uh, the people who are asking us questions this week are part of this crew, and it's a really great, tight knit, super friendly community of people that love space, and it's you know one of the most active communities. There's only about 120 people in the community, I think, but they're as active as the entire space community, which is like more than 100,000 people. So if you're really into space, I highly recommend go and hang out with those folks at the WSH crew. They will make you feel right at home. I have no announcements other than right. my brand newly fixed, very old computer is in a box in the hallway, and I really want to assemble it. Well, then I... <laughs> Then I then I grant you uh, permission to go and fix your computer. So Pamela, thank you so much once again for doing the show and for toughing through the technical issues that we're having. Everybody watching, a double thanks to you for toughing through the technical uh, difficulties that we've been having. I know it's uh, last week was was watching Pam time lapse Pamela, and this week is mega delay Pamela. So uh, hopefully next week we'll be uh, back up and running at the proper speed. So so. We will see you all. Uh, the next thing I think is going to be learning space on Wednesday, and then we're going to be doing the weekly space hangout on Friday at noon. Wednesday. Awesome. All right. We will see you all next time.